I'm going to start my talk in a rather unusual way. I'm going to start with a couple of things that I'm not going to be talking about. That's because I think they're so important that I wanted to touch on them anyway, even though I won't have time to go into them in depth. Children do not need basic literacy skills to be ready for school. Children need basic language skills, oral language, to be ready for school. Children need early education. At the ages of three to five, they need active, hands-on learning play. They do not need early academic instruction to be ready for school. Now, that's important. You're going to make me go over time. <laughs> now, that's important because little kids are not built to be sitting still for any length of time listening to verbal instruction, especially little boys. And if we try to insist that they do that, they'll come to dread school and form long-lasting impressions of themselves as stupid and unable to learn. The other thing I wanted to mention is that in a recent analysis of student outcomes worldwide, the two countries that came out on top are Finland and South Korea. And that's consistent with what other researchers found. Now, what do Finland and South Korea have in common? Not much. But in both countries, the standards for getting into teacher training at university are extremely high. The respect for teachers is enormous. And teachers are paid extremely well. So think about it. So think about it. To get the best student outcomes, we need to attract the best and the brightest to go into teaching, and we need to respect them and compensate them accordingly. OK, now on to my talk for today. What abilities, what abilities and skills will be needed for success in the 21st century? Well, one of them is self-control, having the self-control to resist temptations and not act impulsively. To think before we speak or act, so we don't do something we'd regret or put our foot in our mouths. To wait before making up our minds, so we don't jump to a conclusion or prejudge. Another is discipline and perseverance, having the discipline to stay on task and complete it. To resist temptations to quit because you're bored, you're frustrated, there are a lot more fun things to do. Continuing to work, even though the reward might be a long time in coming. Also, creativity in seeing connections between seemingly unconnected ideas or facts, playing with information and ideas in your mind, relating one to another, then disassembling those combinations and putting the elements together in new ways. Working memory involves holding information in mind and working with it. It's critical for things like reasoning. And creativity in seeing familiar things in new ways from different perspectives. If one way of solving a problem isn't working, can we conceive of the problem in a different way? Can we think outside the box to attack the problem in a different way? And finally, flexibility. Having the flexibility to take advantage of serendipity, to navigate around unforeseen obstacles, and to admit we were wrong when we get more information. Executive functions is shorthand for all of the abilities I just mentioned. And executive functions happen to be my specialty. Executive functions are important for every aspect of life. Success in school, success in the workplace, making and keeping friends, marital harmony, and avoiding things like unplanned pregnancy, substance abuse, or driving fatalities. In other words, uh, self-control, creativity, reasoning, mental flexibility, discipline, and perseverance are really important. And they're often more predictive than IQ. If you want your child to do well in school and in life, help your child develop healthy executive functions. The good news is that executive functions can be improved. In fact, many different activities have been shown to improve executive functions, including computerized training, games, aerobics, traditional martial arts, yoga, mindfulness, and certain school curricula, like Tools of the Mind, Montessori, and PASS. I predict that the activities that will most successfully improve executive functions are those that not only train and challenge executive functions, but also indirectly support <laughs> executive functions by lessening things that impair them and enhancing things that support them. Now, what things impair and what things support executive functions? Executive functions depend on prefrontal cortex and the other neural regions with which it is interconnected. 
prefrontal cortex is the newest area of the brain and the most vulnerable. If you're sad or stressed, lonely, sleep deprived, or not physically fit, prefrontal cortex and executive functions will be the first to suffer and will suffer the most. Stress impairs executive functions and cause anyone to look as if he or she has an executive function impairment, like ADHD, when that's not the case at all. When you're stressed, you probably can't think as clearly or exercise as good self-control. When I'm stressed, I reach for the chocolate. <laughs> if you're stressed, you can't be the teacher or parent you want to be. You need to be able to relax. Don't get all stressed and down on yourself because you're not the perfect parent. Remember, imperfect is not the same as worthless. Even the people you most respect make mistakes and have done things they regret. Everyone makes mistakes and everyone is imperfect. Yet each of us is wonderful in our own way. You can be a terrific parent even though you're not the perfect parent. Your humanity is more important than your knowledge or skill or doing the textbook perfect thing. Your caring, your openness to truly listen when your child needs you to be there for your child is more important than your knowledge or skill. One major source of stress for many children is feeling that they're not smart enough, that they can't learn and will not succeed. It's important to communicate loud and clear the faith and expectation that each child will succeed. When a toddler falls while trying to walk, we never say you get a D in walking today. <laughs> it would never occur to us. We say, don't worry, I'm sure you're gonna be able to do this. How different is that from what children hear in school? They hear you get a D. Instead of, don't worry, there's no question you're gonna be able to do this. And we together are gonna figure out a way to make that happen. A school in British Columbia has as its motto, if you can't learn the way we teach, we'll teach the way you learn. How terrific is that? Children need to believe in themselves. For example, there's a stereotype in our culture that men are better in math than women. And sure enough, when a group of researchers went to a university and gave a standardized math test, as a group, the male students performed better than the female students. Then the researchers tested another group of entirely comparable university students on exactly the same exam. The only difference was they added one sentence before the exam. They said, this particular test has been designed to be gender neutral. On this particular test, women perform as well as men. And what happened? The women performed as well as the men. It was the same test the first group got. The only difference was whether the women expected themselves to do well or not. Our expectations for ourselves often become self-fulfilling prophecies. Many children are so terrified of making a mistake that they're afraid to try anything new. Making a mistake is not the worst thing in the world. We need to let children know it's okay to make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. The only alternative is to stay with what you already know and stop growing. The important thing is how you react after you've made a mistake or fallen short of a goal. I love this quote and I particularly love it because of who said it. You've never failed until you've tried for the last time and you've never lost until you quit. Samuel Proctor Macy was born in the segregated South in the early 1900s. You know he experienced a lot of discrimination, setbacks, and failures. Yet he rose to become one of the most highly respected and decorated chemists of the 20th century. You haven't failed until you stop trying. If children are afraid to try something new, afraid they'll be penalized for a mistake, we need to show them that they'll be rewarded for trying. If what gets graded is what children see as important, we need to reward them with an A under a new category, the courage to try something new, to risk being wrong. Let's return to what things impair and what things support executive functions. Our brains work better when we're not feeling lonely or socially isolated, and that's particularly true for prefrontal cortex and executive functions. In one study, researchers told a group of subjects that they would have close relationships throughout their lives. They told another group the opposite and a third group unrelated bad news. On simple memorization questions that don't require prefrontal cortex, all three groups perform comparably. But on logical reasoning that requires executive functions, 
Those told to expect that they'd be lonely performed worse. Other researchers haven't tried to manipulate this. They simply give subjects a survey when they come in the lab, and that includes questions like, do you feel socially supported? Do you feel lonely? And one research group found that prefrontal cortex functions more efficiently in those who report they feel more lonely and isolated. We are fundamentally social. We need to belong. We need to fit in and be liked. Children who are lonely or ostracized will have more difficulty learning. And it's not just peers. A close relationship with a caring adult can be huge. Our brains work better when our bodies are physically fit. And that's particularly true for prefrontal cortex and executive function. Our brains don't recognize the same sharp division between cognitive and motor function that we impose in our thinking. The same or substantially overlapping brain systems subserve both cognitive and motor function. For example, one region of the brain called the pre-SMA is important for sequential tasks. And it doesn't matter whether they're sequential motor tasks or sequential cognitive tasks. The different parts of the human being are fundamentally interrelated. Each part is affected by and affects the other parts. Let's return to my prediction. Those activities that most successfully improve executive functions should not only work on training and improving executive functions, but also indirectly support executive function by working to reduce things that impair them and working to enhance things that support them. Well, what activities directly train and challenge executive functions and indirectly support them by also addressing our social, emotional, and physical needs? Traditional activities that have been around for millennia for tens of thousands of years across all cultures. Storytelling, dance, art, music, and play have been part of the human condition. People in all cultures made music, sang, danced, did sports, and played games. There are good reasons why those activities have lasted so long and arose everywhere. Certainly, they helped develop motor skills, such as bimanual and eye-hand coordination, balance, strength and flexibility, and lung capacity. And they also train and challenge executive functions. In this short video, you'll see the National Dance Institute. The basis of the NDITT is setting high standards for children. NDI teachers just don't accept mediocrity. The movement itself is very challenging, and they're constantly changing directions, changing counts. People are doing things at different times. That's a big concept for kids at this age. It's a lot easier to focus, because when you learn to focus on something that's fun, sometimes, if you want to, you can learn to focus on something that's not so fun. These activities also address our social needs, providing feelings of belonging and social support. Here, you'll first see the National Dance Institute, and then rather abruptly, the video will switch to youth circus, and you'll see two or three different youth circus groups. They learn to understand that each one of them is an important element to the success of the whole team. As a kid, it's like, if you're in class and you feel like you're not succeeding in class, NDI was the one place where if you didn't get the step, you didn't quit. You had everyone supporting you and encouraging you, and you got it. When the children dance, their differences disappear. Whatever challenges they face in their home life or their private life or at school, they leave that at the stage door. And they all become dancers, an ensemble of dancers. It really teaches you to work with each other, not just an individual, but that they must count on each other, trust each other, be aware of each other, listen to each other. So what is Art Cirque? Circus, in fact, is just a pretext, a pretext to create a circle of trust and a, a space where people can communicate with each other. An area where you can work on yourself, trust the other, and dream. And of course they provide joy, building children's feelings of pride and self-confidence. Here you'll first see Youth Circus, then El Sistema Orchestra, and finally the National Dance Institute. It makes accepting challenges in school and in other areas of their life much easier. It meets them in a way that allows them to just move ahead a little at a time. And the little at a time that they move ahead, they very slowly develop a belief in themselves. Last year at the proms, here in the Royal Albert Hall, something amazing happened. A 
huge orchestra of kids from the shanty towns of Venezuela came to play Shostakovich's 10th symphony. Abrea, but he believes in the orchestra as a unique instrument for socializing children, for giving them discipline, for giving them passion. For kids that maybe haven't succeeded in anything else, maybe don't speak very well, don't do math, you see these kids getting better at everything because it gives them, it gives them that kind of investment in, in their own identity. As I can do this. You'll see a transformation when you go watch an NDI class. When you are young and you do something positive, you've achieved something. That sticks with you all your life. I shudder to think what I might be doing if NDI hadn't come along when they did. NDI made me feel special because no one else, no one else did. They took a chance on a kid they didn't even know. We provide the program for an entire grade level. It's not an audition program. Every child participates, and if they commit, they are guaranteed success. Music, dance, circus, theater, positive sports, and more address our physical, cognitive, emotional, and social needs. Therefore, I predict they should improve executive functions. But that's only a prediction because, incredibly, there is no hard scientific evidence on the benefits of any of these activities for executive functions. There's lots of evidence of correlations. For example, students in band or sports often do better in school. But we have no way of knowing if they might have done better in school anyway, even if they hadn't been in band or sports. There's lots of anecdotal data, testimonials, and personal accounts of how these activities have transformed kids' lives. And there are good theoretical reasons, such as I've presented here, derived from solid scientific data that these activities should help but the hard scientific evidence is missing. My grant applications to fund basic neuroscience research, like the role of dopamine in prefrontal cortex, sail through scientific review and have been continuously funded by the government for over 25 years. But when I request funding for solid research on the benefits of dance, music like El Sistema, or heaven forbid, youth circus, reviewers' eyes glaze over. They say, study dance? That sounds flaky. So I'm hoping that people who share my belief that these activities can transform kids' lives might step forward to help fund the research that's so badly needed. Research showing hard data on the benefits of these activities for executive functions is sorely needed because these activities, the arts, physical exercise, and play, are being squeezed out of school curricula to make more time for academic instruction. While it may seem logical, that if you want to improve academic outcomes, you should concentrate on academic outcomes alone. Not everything that seems logical is correct. Counterintuitively, the most efficient and effective strategy for advancing academic achievement is probably not to focus on academics only. We need to care about the whole child if we want to improve academic achievement. If we focus only on academics, we are less likely to succeed. The arts, play, and physical activity may be critical for achieving the outcomes we all want for our children. Thank you very much.